Francois Aguirre is a partner at Collar Capital. Prior to joining Collar Capital in 2007, Francois worked in the investment banking division of UBS in London. And previously, he worked at Gimar Finance and PAI Partners in Paris and at Societe Generale in New York. Francois has an MSc in engineering and also holds an MBA at INSEAD. Francois, thank you so much for agreeing to take part in our Inspiring Leaders video series. We're delighted to have you participate. Can you please start by providing our viewers with an overview of Collar Capital, uh, its global operations, and where it sits from the private equity market, please? Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. Much appreciated. Mm -hmm. So Collar Capital is um, today what you would consider a large private equity firm. And large private equity firm because we manage close to $17 billion today. Um, and so we are probably in the top 50 PE firms mm -hmm. in, in the market out there. Uh, the firm was started uh, 26 years ago, 1990, based here in, uh, in London. And we've got today uh, three operations. So London is the main one, mm -hmm. New York and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. It sounds very global and international because of the nature of the business, Absolutely. second race, which is very international. And, uh, and we have today close to 200 people. Around a third of the uh, employees are investment professionals and two thirds are all sort of support functions mm -hmm. um, from investor relations to finance to um, investment um, IT and, uh, and marketing communications. Okay, so it sounds like a, a, a private equity firm which is a leader in its field. It's, it's a leader today, definitely a leader in secondaries and secondaries market is um, it's still a bit of a newcomer into the uh, private equity world. Mm -hmm. Um, if you think about it, um, most of the strategies, buyout, venture, yeah. and, and others have been around for a long time. Uh, secondaries really took off only, I would say, 10, 15 years ago. And, um, and a couple of uh, large players are today really running and, and developing that market. It's, um, it's a tiny market in a way uh, with only 40 billion of 40, 45 billion of investments on a yearly basis but uh, it's been growing almost 20% per annum over the last 10 years or so. So th something really unheard of in, in the private equity world. Um, you know, in the, um, in the overall PE sector, in particular since the global financial crisis, mm -hmm. uh, most uh, strategies have stagnated more or less where they were pre-crisis. Sure. Uh, so a, a market growing 20% a year is obviously a very different dynamic. It's interesting um, because I think um, the secondary marketing is one of those markets that students don't really understand. Can you sort of give us an, a, 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 the history of the, of the secondary market, what, what it actually is and, and why it exists? Yeah. I, think, I think very few people actually even working in finance do understand the secondary market because it's not well known. And it's not well known because it doesn't quite often make the uh, front page of the EFT. Sure. You know, yeah. We're not buying big companies, we're not mm -hmm. having that type of, of impact in the um, economic environment. When, when the market started, really the concept was about um, how can we bring some liquidity in a market which is by nature mm -hmm. illiquid. Uh, you invest as an investor into a private equity fund and you are usually for at least 10 years, often 12, if not 15 or 16, you are um, stuck with, with your investment, you mm -hmm. know, uh, technically or effectively. And, um, and so a few people uh, in the 90s, including uh, Jeremy Collar, who mm -hmm. funded um, uh, Collar Capital, um, came really with this concept of if you want at some point to monetize, to liquidate, to exit your private investments, um, you know, how, can you, how can you find a solution? Absolutely. And we were the solution. So in, initially, quite a niche market and trying to, uh, to bring that liquidity. It's today a, a much different market. Uh, today, it is really uh, a portfolio management tool okay. market more than anything else. A significant part of the market is for large institutional investors to manage their private equity portfolio as they would manage their real estate portfolio, fixed income portfolio, equities portfolio, i.e. on an active basis. And, um, and to be able to do that, you need sophisticated buyers on your mm -hmm. side with enough dry powder and also quite a bit of experience to make the process, which is a transaction process, uh, make it as smooth as, as possible. So, um, so it's uh, today a much more sophisticated market, as I said. In terms of assets, it's not anymore only fund positions. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of portfolio of illiquid assets which are transacted in that market. 
but uh, more than uh, more often than not between institutional investors and therefore again not going through the media coverage okay so so just just to get my clarification my understanding it started off as um, providing liquidity for investors and then now it's much become much more complicated that's what I'm hearing yeah so and so I, I make it um, I make it maybe a bit uh, a bit simpler so it was liquidity for investors sure. initially for people in need of some liquidity. Mm -hmm. It was not intuitive at the beginning that okay. you would search for liquidity in private equity because you were going for a premium attached to the liquidity. Yep. Um, today, investors' behavior is quite different. Mm -hmm. Today, they are used now to being able to manage actively their portfolio, irrespective of the asset class, okay. including private equity. Okay. What are some of the key challenges facing the private equity sector at the moment? And what is Collar Capital doing to combat some of these challenges? So I think, I think uh, some of the um, main challenges that we face in private equity, and uh, that's true for any other subcategories in a way, uh, are the same challenges that any investors would face. Mm -hmm. The first one is lack of growth, generally speaking, in the developed world in particular. And uh, you can take more risk in emerging markets, mm -hmm. for instance, but it's, it's a limited opportunity in terms of investment volume. Mm. So in, in the developed world, uh, lack of growth. So then how do you generate returns when there's mm. no growth? A second element, which is, uh, which is one of the key challenges, is um, actually a lot of capital. There's a lot of capital in private equity for mm. two reasons. The first one is um, quantitative easing yeah. in all parts of the developed world again. Uh, so you've had so much capital going in and staying in the financial um, sector in a way um, that has led to increased competition on pricing mm. not necessarily because you've got more players but mm. just you've got more capital having to invest in sales and and that has been even more so the case in private equity because the asset class has performed quite strongly compared mm. to any other asset class in mm. asset management and because of that you've had a number of institutional investors trying to reallocate some of their capital from fixed income, for instance, or other places into private equity, into yeah. private debt. So two effects, the reallocation and the initial amount of capital uh, have led to, um, to a lot of capital available. Just to put in perspective, maybe, mm -hmm. in the bio sector, the estimates are that it's around four years of dry powder available, mm -hmm. uh, which is, which is a you know, high ratio. And, um, and so you've got, um, you've got close to 15,000, so 1.5 trillion of dry powder available in, in that segment. Okay. You mentioned the emerging markets, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if in the future the emerging markets will, will play a bigger role in, in, in private equity from investors. And what, what are your thoughts on, yeah. thoughts on that? I think, I think it's very likely that it will. Yeah. And, and year after year, you see... Um, you see um, you know, significant increase of the uh, of the transaction volume and of the uh, of the number of uh, countries as well, mm -hmm. which are um, which are concerned by by private equity. You know, some time ago it was only one or two countries in 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 Africa, and you've got mm -hmm. today a, a number of them where private equity is actively uh, present. So um, so that will that will definitely uh, continue. It's starting from a lower base. So even if you have a ten percent you know growth rate, for instance. On a smaller number, it takes quite some time to catch up with um, with the larger uh, geographies, but uh, but it's definitely an area of growth. Okay. Um, the next few questions really focus on on the career path within within private equity yeah. because it is one of those sectors that you can't just sort of walk into with it with it with a graduate program. Um, either you need to be connected or go through a different route. So, can you sort of provide our viewers with an overview of? what the typical career path looks like. So, so, for example, becoming an analyst to an associate, what does that look like? Yeah, no, I, think, I think you're right. I think um, you know, it's, uh, it's too small a sector mm. to effectively have the same industrial, let's say, uh, yeah. hiring uh, uh, processes as you would have in, uh, like in banking, for mm -hmm. instance. So I think one element which is important to, to have in mind is that for most established private equity firms, um, they like to uh, to hire people who have 
a bit of financial education, mm. and so typically a number of um, a number of the, the recruits would come from um, from banking. Yeah. And and the idea is, um, you know, how can we leverage on basically the banking investment mm -hmm. and and get people uh, able to uh, to work from day one uh, when when mm -hmm. they join. Um, it's uh, you've got also a number of um, of MBS or mm -hmm. um, MSc finance or that mm -hmm. sort of um, of graduate programs which are uh, which are looked for mm -hmm. uh, very clearly. Then then the main question is is not. Is not only about the education; it's um, it's really about the competition. Yeah, it's about the competition because you've got a huge number of applicants for a limited number of uh, of seats, mm -hmm. and um, and it's highly, I think, it's highly unlikely that that would change anytime soon, and just because the number of PE firms is unlikely to grow dramatically, mm -hmm. and at the same time, the pool of potential people going through. Uh, banking, MBAs, MSc, finance, mm -hmm. and so on, uh, is is just a huge number. Yeah. Um, so, so I think uh, I think what's very important um, at that uh, at that moment is to, um, if you are one of those you know young potential recruits, is to think about how to connect with yeah. the private equity world. Um, some people would go on to um, all uh, specialized headhunter uh, mm -hmm. in the market and try to get. Known and try mm. to be pushed, you know, on top of the pile of um, of the uh, potential recruits. Um, some people would uh, definitely try to connect with people from their network. Mm. Um, so you have, so as you mentioned, you know, I've got mm. uh, an inside MBA, and um, in Europe, for instance, you do have not in every single private equity firm an inside grad, but in many, many of them. So you need to identify across the P. Uh, sector which um, which networks are particularly represented, and if then you kind of back solve, you can try to join one of those networks mm -hmm. you know, to accelerate the connection. Connecting is very important because uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of people judgment when uh, when young, younger recruits are hired in in those firms, and so and so you need to you need to want sorry. You need to be able to to really demonstrate more than your CV can tell. You know, there are so many CVs which look alike. Yeah, great CVs. Don't get me wrong, right? All of them great CVs, but but the difference or the distinction selection is made on something else. Okay. Um, you mentioned um, the MBA being a route into the sector. Yeah. You mentioned MSc finance degrees being a route in the sector. What are your thoughts on, say, a candidate who? qualifies um, with a chartered accountancy qualification with training with say four or five years in a top four firm yeah. um, what is the value of that can you see that linking into private equity at all so definitely I would say definitely and that that's an interesting question because from my perspective it is um, a bit of a national question I would say mm -hmm. so you know I travel a lot uh, in the world for my job but in particular I travel a lot across Europe yeah and uh, and it's very interesting to see that from one country to another, You've got always Different perspectives, some yeah. specificities. Yes, you know, at course. the end of the day, there is a common ground yeah. between uh, between all of them, yeah. but uh, but nonetheless, it's much more finance orientated here in the UK, for instance. In France, it's much more France and Italy, for instance, much more balance between finance on one side or consulting, yeah. strategy consulting on the other side. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so you've got all of those uh, specificities, and and it's definitely a matter of uh, you know homework. Yeah. Um, preparation is uh, is critical when you go into those firms because, as I said, the competition is so tough to get in that you may end up being hired not necessarily because you've been so great, but just because you've made no mistake. Yeah, it's very easy on the other side to to think any single mistake will be uh, you know will be a, a cause for dismiss dismissal, yeah. and uh, so when you when you hear about those firms who have. 15 different interviews with 15 different people and if only one person says no then the candidate is out yeah it's not so much that those firms are trying to be um, too arrogant or too selective or anything like that it's just that it's it's a negative selection process yeah anyway and so um, and so you know we do have a number of uh, chatter accountants yeah uh, and coming from big falls in, in, in our team and not surprisingly some of them are British yeah you know and uh, and so we, I think I think there are a number of channels which uh, which allow to to get you in. Great. Okay. So talking about Collar Capital, um, how does Collar Capital choose its young talent? 
Yeah, so at Color, what we, we've got two different entry levels, effectively. One entry, which is on the junior side, it's really analyst equivalent. Yeah. And that level, I would say, is, is more um, simple than, mm. than the next one. And more simple because you want people who have two or three years of banking or banking equivalence or mm. you know, can deal with numbers. And their day-to-day -day job is going to be quite analytical. Yeah. And, um, and the um, contract, the moral contract with, with those people is that they're going to come to color, they're going to learn a lot from what they do, and then probably at some point move on to something else, which could be a graduate program, could be a different job, or it's, um, it's a more specific analyst type of program. People who join as associates at color, mm. they come usually from a background which is around, let's say, five years, five years of experience. Could be an MBA, could be no MBA, uh, no, uh, no strict uh, criteria there. But at that level, because those people are more experienced and because they expect more from their career, we try to identify people who would have what we call the partner potential. Okay. And in partner potential, by definition, when so we hire probably five to eight of them every year. Um, you know, can you can you find every year five to eight people who absolutely will make it partner mm. uh, five ten years down the road? Of course not. Mm -hmm. But uh, but we're trying nonetheless to to capture that. And to capture that, the big difference is really in terms of their inter interpersonal skills, yeah. inter their behavior, their mindset. You know, are there people who can, um, even if they work all day long, can they step back for a second, get the overview, and be able to engage in um, in relationship and discussion with with the external people, which which really, as a partner, most of what they will do. You know, most of what you do as a partner in a firm like ours is about finding investments. It's about uh, convincing investors. Yeah. To be able to do that, it's not so much, you know, the masterizing of Excel. Okay, well, that brings me on to the next question about working in private equity. Obviously, you need to have those technical skills. You need to have those sound um, educational experiences. But interpersonal skills are important too. Um, some of the other people that I've interviewed for, 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 for this series have said that it's a people business. Um, what does that mean, mean to is. you? Yeah, it is, it is very much so a people business because, and that connects quite a bit with uh, your previous question, which was, you know, there are challenges in the mm -hmm. industry. What do you do? In our business today, even though there are more intermediaries, including in secondaries, but in private equity in general, mm -hmm. even though uh, this market is uh, more efficient to some extent, um, you know, all of us are still spending a huge amount of effort on origination. Yeah. And origination is really a very similar job from my perspective, whether it's for investment or for investor. Okay. At the end of the day, you are dealing with external people and you're trying to convince them to do business with you yeah. in a very traditional way. Um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not you buying a piece of Microsoft on, on a computer or it's not uh, you buying online some products. You, you go and you meet with people uh, on a daily basis and um, and you want to reach an agreement on both sides that you are really keen to work together because it's going to be a long-term relationship in most of the time most of the cases you know it could be five-year investment uh, in a company it could be a 10-year into mm -hmm. a fund so to establish those connections and to convince people is very difficult it's very difficult and uh, and unless you are an amazing investor an amazing performer and in private equity, you've got, of course, firms who outperform amazingly. Mm. But, uh, but it's not always easy, fund after fund after fund. And, uh, and so you definitely want to, to create an additional, um, an additional layer of relationship yeah. um, to, um, you know, to work productively uh, over the years. Okay. The next few questions focus on leadership. Now, it's that old age question. Yeah. Uh, can leadership be taught or is that something intrinsically uh, within oneself? Uh, what does leadership mean to you and what do you look for in, in leaders? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's a question which is very related in our mind to yeah. the origination effort, the impact of the team. Mm -hmm. You know, a private equity firm at the end of the day is, um, is a team. It can be a very large team. We've got 60 people. It can be a smaller team, three, four people, but, but it's nonetheless a team. And um, with most firms, 
it is really the um, ability of the team to be successful which allows the firm to be successful. Yeah. It's pretty rare that you're going to have a star trader, you know, making a huge difference for a huge difference for the whole firm. And um, and so and so leadership comes in and and is a very important component of it. Mm -hmm. Because you look at all private equity firms and the profile of the people, it's very strong profiles. And so what makes a difference, as you would see today, between a Leicester and, and an Arsenal or somebody else, mm -hmm. not picking up any preference here, mm -hmm. but you know, they do have great players. Um, you know, sometimes the magic works and sometimes the ma magic yeah. doesn't work. In, in private equity, it's, it's the same. I think, I think leadership um, you know, is known, it's been studied so mm -hmm. much, um, mm -hmm. so it's known in terms of key characteristics. Uh, some people have them more naturally than others. Can you, um, can you teach them or can you learn more? Can you work on it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you've got so many um, experiences shared in books and so on. When you see successful people telling you their, their own journey through it. So, um, so it is possible. It's, um, you know, it's a matter in, in private equity. I think it's really a matter of, um, of keeping people excited about their work yeah because it's so competitive on a daily basis that um that you want people to demonstrate an eagerness which is really above above normal okay the next question is about how organizations such as ours and universities such as ours provide talent how can we work more closely with the private equity sector to provide talent for the sector yeah i mean if i would say um you know i'm sure i'm sure there are lots of things um, you know, any institution can do. If I think of my own experience with INSEAD, because I, yeah, I keep yeah. very active um, uh, with, uh, with the organization, um, you know, they do have a number of PE tracks mm. every year. So I think, that, I think they have two at least, and they've got two as well on venture capital. So what is it? It's really about having students uh, going to the various private equity sure. uh, firms in London, touring around, an hour, an hour and a half of presentation, bringing, and so that bringing in you know, 15 to 20 people, yeah. that, that allows uh, the PE firms to actually become aware of such or such institution sure. versus another. Um, you know, obviously your students, when they go into the market, um, are in competition with other yeah, students absolutely. from other institutions. Yeah, yeah. So, so it has to be, one or another, it has to be you becoming competitive with others. Yeah. You know? and, uh, and so I, I think PE tracks are very uh, right. powerful. Um, I think um, there's one element which is, uh, as I mentioned, which is network. Yeah. And so um, it, it's about identifying the current network that mm -hmm. you have in private equity and how to leverage that and how to increase mm -hmm. that network. Uh, the stronger it becomes, the more likelihood of getting students in. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's um, uh, as we said earlier, it's a people's business, and all of us we have that bit of a bias that somebody you know, who shares some of our values or yeah. history um, is easier to work with compared to others. Okay. Um, sometimes it goes, sometimes it's not, but we've got that bias, okay. for sure. Um, so, um, you know, you've got a big advantage, which is that you are London-based. Yeah. And so uh, being London-based, London, London -based, you should have access to, um, you should have access definitely to the PE community. You know, at the end of the day, it's about um, investing a bit on your side. It can be money, it can be time. And to to increase awareness within the PSA. Absolutely, uh, that's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing stronger links uh, between yeah. between the sector, and that's not just from uh, treks, which are great, but also from the academic side as well, and um, raising our profile within the sector. Thank you very much. Finally, if you can give any words of advice to our students who want to enter the sector, what is it about private equity that excites you? Um, you know, that, that makes us such a great um, industry to work in. Yeah, I think it's. Um you know, a career choice is a very important choice, mm. I do think. And, um, and I think private equity still has quite a bit of uh, attractiveness, which is coming from, um, from the view that it's um, an amazingly interesting job and a place where you can make a lot of money. Yeah. If I say it in simplistic terms. Um, and, and I think it's important that people have in mind that um, to some extent the world has changed a little bit. From what it was, and when I say that's because today the private equity world is a very structured 
world. And you've got uh, a lot of people who've gone into the sector before before you. And so it's um, it's a very it's still a very inter intellectually interesting world to work in. But uh, it's a place where you really need to be successful for a long time before you can collect the fruits of your success. Mm -hmm. And the fruits are very, very significant, don't get me wrong. Um, but, uh, but it's not something which will happen over you know, five, six, seven years. Mm -hmm. It takes much longer than that. And that really shouldn't be the drive if you want so, to work in that sector. So I think, I think it shouldn't be the drive yeah. because, because it's very difficult to to be sure yeah. that you can be successful over, let's say, 10 years, you know, in any career choice you sure. would make. So I think, I think what is very important more than anything else is, and that's something which, which I learned myself at INSEAD, um, how can you have a good assessment of yourself so that you identify the place where you are most likely to be successful because this is where your strength yeah. would be um, the most effective. Absolutely. If you identify that, you know, you can be amazingly successful in pharmaceuticals or you can be amazingly successful in private equity or in other places. Mm. But, but that, that is actually the big difference. It's not because you put um, one of, you, of your foot into private equity that you increase your chances of success, really. You know, a lot of people get in. After two, three years, a lot of people get out. Yes. And they've had a bit of a taste of what it is, which I think, again, is very, really interesting the quality of the people you meet is amazing. Yeah. The quality of the of the project you work on uh, is really is really high. So so intellectually it's it's really interesting. But if you come in and you get out after three years and um, and you've missed three years in in different career paths where you could have been much more successful over three years, I'm not sure that's the right choice. So it's it's taking the time to really research and Absolutely. asking the right questions and and if if you feel this is a career path for you then go for it but otherwise yeah keep your options open yeah don't don't be blinded by the stars yeah. around around it the good news is it takes some time quite some time mm. to get into it so hopefully that's enough time so that each person can really think thoroughly mm. about the plus and minuses and how it fits or not one's personality um but um but if you, if you find out that it, it does match, it's, uh, it's an, an amazing adventure. Great. Francois, on behalf of everyone at the Institute of Financial Services, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, David.